brought to you by Brass and Unity. We make wearable conversation starters. Our new buddy check packs are available now. Grab one and check on one of your closest buddies. They may need it now more than ever. Go to brassandunity.com, use the code UNITY, and get 20% off. And let's all heal together. And brought to you by Combat Flip Flops. Bad for running and even worse for fighting. Combat Flip Flops are your ticket to the unarmed forces by providing you with military-inspired quality footwear for men and women. To help support the podcast and in support of women in developing countries, head over to combatflipflops.com and become a part of their unarmed forces today. Be sure to use the code UNITY at checkout and get 25% off. And brought to you by GFDA. Good fucking design advice. The voice in your head and the foot up your ass. GFDA makes prints, drinkware, and apparel for people who want to do their fucking best. Go and use the code UNITY and get 10% off now on anything on their site, including our collaborative product, Fucking Help Somebody. And brought to you by Daisy May Hat Co., the custom hat company based in Nashville, Tennessee. They make custom one-of-a-kind hats from wide-brimmed fedoras to cowboy hats. All of their hats are 100% beaver felt, and it's the highest quality hat you can get. They also have the coolest shirts ever. You can use the code BRASS at checkout for 15% off your entire order. Go and check out daisymayhats.com. Embrace the fever. Live the dream. And brought to you by Midday Squares. Have you ever tried a Midday Square? They are the first functional chocolate bar, and they're making waves. They're vegan, gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, and non-GMO. They have 6 grams of protein, 4 grams of fiber, and omega-3s. Most importantly, they kill hunger, fuel your brain, boost your mood, and all from natural energy. They're everything a chocolate bar isn't, and everything a protein bar wishes it was. Use the code KELSEY15 at checkout to get 15% off today. Ryan Mickler's in the house, everyone, and a lot of you have been asking, and look, again, I delivered your welcome. Welcome to the show, my friend. It's good to see you. It's been, look, I'm, I, I got to apologize right off the bat. You're like, are we doing this or not? I'm like, yes, I promise we are. I'm just, I'm all over the place, but I'm so glad to be here with you. No, it's okay. Seriously. Like you're not, I've, uh, I often reference Jeff Depati a lot because I make this joke. It took us, I think seven or nine times scheduling back and forth to get it done, but we got it done and it was a very well received episode. So it Good seems work. like those people are worth the wait. And I guess you're obviously worth the wait. So I'm glad we'll that you're out. here. Yeah. Well, I think you'll be just fine. Um, you're so welcome. But it's interesting because you really do come from a, a similar background, but in a different perspective. And you look at the world in a way that I very often get canceled for talking about. Um, mainly that's because of the country I live in. But I also think it's because people's perceptions of certain types of conversations coming from women versus men are often taken completely differently. I agree. I agree. Because I think there's a there's a, an expectation, you know, and, and we all make snap judgments, right? So when I look at you, I have a judgment about how you're going to behave and show up and talk and communicate. And you think the same thing, you know, you see my beard or you see my hat or you see the background. You're like, oh, this is this guy. And then when we step outside of that mold, it shocks people and it threatens their own worldview or their own perception. And they start doubting themselves. Well, I thought this about this person and they're showing up as different than that. So where else am I wrong? And it's kind of threatening, to be honest. It is. And it's kind of fun to watch. I'm not going to lie. There's a point totally. where I do, I, definitely get, I do get a little bit of comic relief when I, when someone does meet me for the first time, the reaction is not what they thought it would be. It's always, it's always welcomed. Um, but it is interesting talking to someone of someone like you, because you do have a lot of similar views as myself, but I do, I got, I, I do have a few questions I want to I want to clarify and kind of push back on and we'll, and we'll kind of get to that um, a little bit on, but I want to start with a little bit about your background and really how you got into order of men. I knew that you were an Iraqi vet. What year was that, that you were in Iraq? Uh, I went, let's see, we were activated. I, let's see. I'm trying to think about the time. It's been so long. It seems like I know, right. Uh, two, <laughs> 2005, January of 2005 is when I so was in a national guard unit is when our unit was activated. So I spent six months stateside in Mississippi and then in California for some acclimation training. Uh, and then I think around June of 2005 through June of 2006, I was in Ramadi, Iraq. Okay. And what was the reasoning behind joining the military or were you one of the, the Patriots after nine 11? Oh, no, no. I'm, 
I, I, uh, I graduated in 99. So I actually joined the national guard when I was 17, I was still in high school. Uh, Yeah. So I, fortunately I had the opportunity to go through some weekend drills with my national guard unit, even before I went to basic training, which would have been the summer of 99. Okay. And, um, I, I really, I wish I could say, I just wanted to be a soldier and I knew what I always want. I, I wish I could say that that's not the truth. <laughs> uh, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I've, I've always been patriotic. I always, I've always, um, honored and, and, and admired and respected our military members. And I thought, you know, where I don't know what I want to do, and this might pay for some schooling. And me and two of my high school buddies decided that we would join the national guard together. So like I said, in, uh, the summer of 99, we went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, went through basic training and so on and so forth. That's a, that's different because I'm very often, especially lately when I'm talking to anybody from the military, it's, it, there's a, Hey, I saw it and I, I joined and it was that kind of conversation, but you got in right before. What was that like when you found out that you were going to be activated to go over there? I actually had some other activations that were going to take place. So as a national guard unit, it's, it's essentially you're, you're drilling once or so per month. So you're putting three, three days in per month. Uh, and then during the summer months, you might have a two to three week. Um, I, I can't even remember what they like call an exercise. It, yeah. Something like that, where we'd yeah. go, whether it was stateside or it's usually in Utah itself, but we'd be gone for a couple of weeks and it was like a vacation, you know, you got to work a little bit, but you're hanging out with your boys. Like it's good. It's easy. Yeah. Uh, and then in 2000, well, actually 2001, our national guard unit got activated to go. I think it was 2000, maybe it was 2000, whenever the salt Lake city Olympics were. And we actually, I spent a month in salt Lake, uh, running patrols and, um, doing security checkpoints for the Olympics in Salt Lake. So that was my first like, quote unquote deployment, I guess you'd say. <laughs> it wasn't really a deployment at all. Again, it was, the it was four hours. Yeah, it was four hours north of where I lived and we were hanging out with the guys. We lived in this old abandoned hospital, which was a little creepy, but you know, <laughs> it was fine. It was no factor. Okay. Uh, and then, and then in 2003, we got activated to go to Iraq and we were in Fort Carson in Colorado when, when that statue of Saddam Hussein was pulled down. I think most people kind of remember that. And I was in the chow hall in line watching that as they were pulling it down and we were about to go to Iraq. Well, about a week, a week before we were going to leave, they said, Hey, never mind. You're not going to Iraq anymore. You're going to uh, Fort Lewis in Washington and you're going to train ROTC cadets for the summer. <laughs> so, so we went to Fort Lewis. And if I remember correctly, we did like four or five days on. And then we had three or four days off. So we'd go into Vancouver. We'd go to Seattle. I watched the Seahawks play with my buddies. We'd go to um, um, uh, Mariners games. Like it was awesome. That, that, was, a, that was my second deployment. Um, and then the third one was, no, you're, we're, we're actually really going to Iraq this time. So, okay, hold on. But you guys get medals for all your deployments. Tell me you got a medal or a ribbon or something from either of these. I'd, I'd have to look. I don't, you I don't do. Much, I know you do. I'm sure I don't put much stock in all that kind of stuff. Cause it's like a participation trophy, but there's probably some sort of like, here's your salt Lake city Olympics ribbon or whatever. I yeah. don't know. I, or there, we had like a presidential citation because our National Guard unit uh, was in the Korean War. So there was a presidential citation uh, uh, ribbon awarded. So as a member of the unit, we we were to wear that presidential citation. I just kind of felt a little bit like stolen valor because I'm, I didn't do any of that. Like I went to the Olympics. Yeah. I went to Fort Lewis in Washington. So oh. I don't ever put myself in the same classification or category as some of these real heroic. I mean, I've had medal of honor recipients on the podcast. Um, I, th- that's a different breed of people than I am. So I I've never, I've never tried to make my service out to be more than what it was. I'm, I'm proud of it, but it's nothing in comparison to what these other people have done. 
Yeah, I haven't seen you ever really kind of boast about it, if I'm honest with you. It took me a while after like listening to your show. I, I am a listener of your show, but um, it did take me a little bit to even realize that you were a vet. At first, I was starting to think, how, who, why is he talking to some of these people? Either you're friends with them or you're connected, but I'm like, no. And then I started doing a dive and I was oh shit, he actually served. I had no idea because it's not a conversation I hear you really kind of go on about and talk about it all. So when you went to Iraq, how long was that deployment for you? So the, the entire deployment, I was gone. Uh, I was, so my wife and I were, were six months married at the time and I was gone for a total of a year and a half, but it was 12 months in country, six months stateside training and getting ready and ramping up for our deployment. And what was your position in the military? So we are, we're an artillery unit. Um, okay. here in, it, well, in Southern Utah, when I lived there, that's where I joined. So an artillery unit. Um, so I was a, uh, I was in fire direction control. So we would take coordinates and information from observers and those yep. on, you know, on the front lines, we would disseminate that information to our howitzers and we would tell them when and where and how to shoot on these targets. So we were the facilitator between the forward observers and the howitzers. And what were you guys firing at the time? Was it the M M triple sevens? It was the, uh, it was Paladin. So self-propelled one five, five Paladin is what it was. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, cause Incredible we fired system. the, Oh, they're, that's what we, we used, uh, the one five fives in Afghan and they are just, I was a gunner. So there is something about those things that nothing yeah. will ever match firing one of those things ever in your lifetime. Were you guys like self-propelled or the toads or like what? We were self-propelled. I, I want to say, cause when we got there, I don't think they were our guns. We ripped out another Canadian reservist unit. Um, that mm. was there. We were at a fob ramrod. We were supporting an American, uh, an American fob. So we were kind of put there and borrowed. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was, there was times, I believe they were self-propelled, but there was definite times where hydraulics just stopped working or you were just mm. firing too close and you were just you know, manually just beating the shit out of yourself on the side of the thing. But, um, yeah, those are, God, those are good times. I had no idea you were, um, that's what you did. That's interesting to me. What was that like for you, that deployment, any issues, anything that was out of the ordinary? I mean, it's all out of the ordinary. <laughs> Like, for Iraq, I mean, about it. yeah, well, <laughs> I guess I'm so used to having conversations with individuals that it just feels like it's second nature now at this point. It's like, so what was your deployment? Like, what was your deployment? Like, it's like we killed yeah. some people. It's fine. Yeah. I mean, we were an artillery unit, but we, we, we jokingly called ourselves an infantillery unit because <laughs> we were doing a lot of, not me personally, but our unit was tasked with three missions. Number one was a patrol mission outside of our FOB, FOB um, a, a, a secondary mission, not even secondary, but just an ancillary mission was uh, base, base defense. And then a, a third component of the mission was a very, very small artillery counterfire mission. And when I went to Iraq, um, I was tasked with managing the, um, the swing in the, in the evening shifts of our base defense. So really my job was to um, take incoming information from observation posts around the base and around the FOB and around the area, uh, figure out how we were going to react and respond to those threats. And then we might call in quick reactionary force or, or, or leave it alone. I mean, there was different ways that we could approach that situation. It was my job to figure out how to do that, which there's a lot of responsibility in that. I, I felt very proud of what we did and I felt a heavy weight because the decisions that I personally would be making could literally spell the difference between life and death for people. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we had incoming rockets and mortars, I would say every day. I mean, I don't think there's a day that went by where we didn't get hit with a mortar or rocket. Um, but I never actually felt not threatened. I, I just, I don't know. I was pretty comfortable with where I was. And, and, and what I mean by that is the, the headspace I was at. If I, if this is what I was tasked to do, and this is what I needed to do, then I'm just going to do it. And, you know, we're going to let the chips fall where they may. If I die, I die. If I don't, well, that's good too. <laughs> Better actually. <laughs> it's a win. It's a win that day. If no one dies. Exactly. God, dark humor though. Isn't that, isn't that a thing? My gosh. I noticed that for me, 
that always seems to come out. I get, I get real uncomfortable and I go, ah, it's all right. As long as no one dies that day, it's, it's a weird people position. Don't under, people that have never been in that situation don't really understand it. And so they look at it as crude or, or crass or, um, you know, un, uncaring or, or, or like cold or calloused. And I just think it's a way that people deal with the reality of their situation. And if that's mm-hmm. what it takes, then by all means. Right. I mean, humor is a humor can heal. I believe that wholeheartedly. I really believe that if we had more humor in people's lives, uh, especially after traumatic events, like th- those types of things, they just make you make you feel like you can move forward. If you just give a little bit of levity just for a second in someone's life, they can see the other side. And that's a, it's Agreed. a great thing. Um, yeah. So I, I want to know how this really happened when you go from the military to the order of men, because there's a huge gap in there. And I know you have been podcasting for, for quite some time now, and you've really put, you put the time in, whereas most people, they're either just starting out, but you've been doing it for a minute and you've got, you've worked your way up to an impressive list, but you've also worked your way up to a really unique community that you've developed over time called order of men. And I'd love it if you could kind of walk me through what that was like to start with that. Yeah. My, I mean, my background is retail management of all things. So I was managing <laughs> clothing stores. So when I got activated to go to Iraq, I had just said my wife and I were married for six months and I was managing a, a clothing store of all things in Southern California. Uh, and so when I left, uh, my wife moved home to Utah, which is where her folks were. And she moved in and lived with them. Uh, and, and the company I was working with buckle is the name of the company. So when I was working with them, they said, Hey, when you get back, you'll have this store back. We'll bring somebody else in to manage it while you're gone. My wife and I made the decision that we, we, I wouldn't be doing that when I came back. Um, I wasn't, I love the work itself. I just wasn't interested in working nights and weekends. And I knew if I wanted to advance within that company that I would probably at some point end up in the middle of nowhere in Nebraska at their home office and headquarters. And I wasn't interested in that. So um, the next thing we did is we bought a house. I was like, I don't know why we did that without she, she, we bought the house. She did all the design work and everything else while I was gone. And when I got back, we ended up moving into the house, but I came home about eight months, I think, or so into my deployment for two weeks. And my father and mother-in-law had met with a financial advisor at the time. And I really didn't have any work lined up for when I got back. And so they introduced me to their financial advisor. And he had said that he was looking for two additional advisors to work with him. So I actually ended up taking all of my insurance and investment licensing exam material to Iraq with me. <laughs> and so in my downtime, while everybody was watching, uh, binge watching 24, or whatever the episodes they were watching, I was, I was studying for my insurance and licensing uh, and investment licensing, came back, took those, um, did that for several years, did that for about nine years. And I started a podcast called Wealth Anatomy. And the podcast was focused on helping medical professionals with their financial services. So insurance, investments, retirement planning. And I realized I love the medium of podcasting. I just was, I was burnt out after nine years of doing it. I didn't want to have that conversation anymore. So I I talked with some friends and decided to just pivot from wealth anatomy and create this thing called order of man. And I did that in 2015 and I've been doing it ever since. And it took off from the beginning, just from day one. And I knew we were on to something pretty quickly. What is it that made you want to discuss the topics and the things that you do on your show? Because they are selfishness. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's it. I, my, my wife and I uh, had gone through some hard times within our relationship. Um, I had, I think I had two children at the time. Uh, I, my business wasn't amazing. It was fine. It wasn't amazing. And I felt like everything was just kind of, bleh, you know, like just dead, you know, everything mm-hmm. was fine. We were making money. I had the family, had the wife, had the kids, had the house, all this kind of stuff. I just felt kind of empty. And I'm really trying at this point to figure out, okay, how do I become a better man? Uh, and there was people that I admired and respected who were podcasting or blogging or writing books and putting out courses. And I thought, man, I'd really like to have a conversation, but why why would they want to have a conversation with me? 
And I thought to myself, well, if I start a podcast, then I can have these one-on-one conversations with these men I'm inspired by. And in return, I'll promote them on my quote unquote network, which was like five people at the time. If they knew that they probably wouldn't have joined me. So I didn't disclose that. (laughs) Uh, And I felt like even today, seven years later, I feel like I'm the biggest recipient of the work that we do. When I have a guy like Terry Crews on or Matthew McConaughey or Ben Shapiro or David Goggins or Jocko Willink. And I get to talk with these guys one-to-one. I mean, what an incredible blessing. And if I can publish these conversations and it, in, in, the, in the meantime, it's helped m- literally millions of men at this point. What an awesome opportunity I've had. It is. It's a, it's a great thing to see what you've grown and um, the caliber of people you have conversations with. It's not that it's not because of their following, but it's because they have something to add. They have a value add that is useful for individuals. And when you are, you posted something recently and I couldn't agree with you more. There is so many people and there are so many shows that you could be listening to cut out the bullshit, only implement and listen to the things that are going to improve your life. At some point, listening to People talk about other people being murdered for hours and hours and hours. Tell me what value add other than paranoia does that really give someone? Or or even more innocuous would be how many daily morning rituals do you need before you create your own to improve your life? Like we're Mm -hmm. all saying the same thing, you know, get up on time, don't hit the snooze get some water, get an exercise in, do some meditation. If that's your thing, get a workout in, have some healthy breakfast Is that your goals. Like how many times do you need to hear that before you actually start doing something about it? And that's kind of a source of frustration in my life right now is I'm a professional podcaster. I have been for seven years. I get paid handsomely for talking. Uh, and yet it's very frustrating when I see people have all of the information they need to accomplish whatever goals they desire. And yet it's like, nah, let me go listen to another podcast. Like, no, like turn that damn podcast off and go do what you learned on the last one. It's, it's a source of frustration. It's just a way for people to pretend like they're moving the needle without actually having to do the real work of moving the needle. You take it personally, huh? No, I don't take it personally. I mean, I'm going to put my information out there whether I want to or not, or whether people adhere to it or not. It's not personal. I just want the best for people. And I know that for myself, I was so consumed in information, like CDs and conferences and emails and courses. And I felt like I was doing something, but really just to put it kind of, kind of brash is like, I felt like I was just like mentally jacking off you know, it felt good, but ultimately I wasn't moving the needle. So I don't take it personally. I just want guys to win. And that means mm. shutting the podcast off and getting your ass to work. Fair enough. I can see why that's a, a sticking point for you. You put a lot of effort into these things and putting out a positive message is a huge part of what you do, but it, you put out a different type of message though, that it's, I do in, in our community. And when I say our community, I'm talking more particularly, maybe vets, first responders, military members, families of military members, and, or individuals that I never say right wing. I always say leaning towards the other direction a little, because I never (laughs) want to marginalize people. We do have plenty of listeners that are super duper duper liberal, and they really do come to us because they want to understand both sides of the things. And being a Canadian, talking to so many Americans, I do feel like I get a bit of a free pass in that I don't have to identify myself with one of your political parties because I'm far enough removed. I live in communism. That's our problem. <laughs> should be yours because we're on top of you, but nobody seems to think it's a deal, but that's We okay. should take it as a very serious threat. That's certainly true, especially with some new regulations with firearms that we ought to be very, very aware of. Oh, so let's, let's, you know what, let's get into a bit of this because you're somebody who's educated enough to have this conversation with me. You can talk about the firearms. I'll talk about the new bills that cover the internet. So I want to, yeah, look team already. We got this. So (laughs) here's the thing, Canada being your hat. So I'm speaking to an American right now, Canada being your hat, the top of you, we are actually burning down. Are you currently aware that Canadians cannot leave freely within their country or out of their country? 
I've heard a lot of those restrictions, but I thought that was more related to COVID restrictions and, and lockdowns and that sort of thing. I'm not, I'm not aware that that's still the case. So it's still the case. So 10% of Canada, Canadians cannot leave, get on a bus, train, uh, or a bus, a train, or a plane within the country or to leave the country hmm. still. And what, what is, who is the 10%? The 10% are the unvaccinated. Hmm. So we're the highest vaccinated country in all of the globe, apparently, and we have 10% that can't leave. We also have a large percentage of individuals who still have lost their jobs because they refuse to get vaccinated, still are unpaid, and still cannot enter locations be based on vaccine status. And mm. it is up to the business whether they choose to do it or not, even though the federal government has said there's no more mandates in technically, we are the only country where the citizens cannot leave or move freely within it or in or out of it. Hmm. The whole globe, whole globe. Yeah. It's insane. I mean, it really is. And, yeah. you know, I feel for what you guys are going through and, and I, I wish and pray and hope and work towards the fact that we would wake up and see that what's going to happen there is generally going to make itself uh, migrate its way South. Well, perfect example. So let's get into the gun laws that were just implemented. Maybe you know a little more about this than I do. So you recently heard that overnight Trudeau decided he was putting a freeze on all purchases, sales of handguns. It'll happen yep. within the next year and a half. Trudeau did this three years ago on any, I believe it was... Huh. What you guys call AR. So any sort of long barrel rifle, including hunting rifles, those have been removed as well. So we are now trickling down in conjunction with Canada doing that. You guys also got a lovely notification from what you call a president. And he now is cracking down on your guns. So can you really explain to me and maybe the listeners in a, in a very stern way why this is a problem for Americans? Well, let me just change the verbiage a little bit. He may, you, you said cracking down on his verbiage is more intense maybe than it has okay. been in the past, but he doesn't have the authority to be able to make and mandate these types of things, right? This okay. all has to go through a regulatory body, Congress, namely, and House of Representatives, um, which, you know, coming up, we've got midterm elections and Hopefully, and the goal is, is that during the midterm elections, we elect more conservatives to tip the tides. Because right now, uh, the the liberals represent the three main branches of the of the United States government. So, House of Congress, uh, or excuse me, House of Representatives, the Senate, and the presidency. So, a president doesn't have the authority to make a, a mandate like that, which is a, a beautiful thing. <laughs> like we don't for want now. one per, for now. Sure. There are a lot of executive orders and the abuse of executive orders that that have kind of usurped that process, but that is the process as it's written in the Constitution. Um, yeah, I mean, it's important that we defend our right to bear arms. I, I don't know what your right is as far as bearing arms in, in Canada. I don't I don't yeah. I don't pretend to know that. But in America, we have the Second Amendment, which is the yeah. right to bear arms like that is a right. It's a God given right protected by the federal government. And when the federal government starts to dictate or tell us that we no longer have the right to bear arms, then we have a moral and, and, and a responsibility and obligation to fight back against that. Now, the government, more of the liberal side of the government, will say, well, you know, why do you need an AR, for example, to hunt? Well, that isn't the only reason that we know that we should own guns. Sure, I hunt. I own rifles to hunt. But I also own handguns, I own shotguns, I own AR platforms for self-defense reasons. It isn't for sport, it isn't for hunting, it's for self-defense. And if there's hundreds of millions, which there are, firearms in the hands of Americans, that keeps a government who would love, love nothing more than to subjugate its citizens at bay, then I'm all for it. Yeah, I see. I, I have this conversation often with my husband when we talk about moving and why so many people are like, why are you still living there? And I, I say the same thing every time. And it's the conversation's very simple. I served for it once. I'll serve for it again. 
I'm not going to not fight for the place that I was born and raised. That being said, at some point, you've got to do something and the system has to be shook. And the only reason I believe that here, because here's what's crazy, right? Is we, if I'm, and I'll get this number correct and I'll make sure to edit this, but I want to say we are like, I believe the fifth uh, most armed population in the world. Like Canada has a significant amount of guns. We do. We just do not have the same rights as you do with them. So we do, we cannot get um, concealed carry. We, that's not a thing. If we want to go to the range, we got to make a call. We got to let them know we're going there. The ammunition has to be separate. The gun has to stay here. You can fire for this amount of time, then you have to bring the gun back and has to go locked into here. Like it's not, we do not have the same where you can go into Texas and see a dude sitting there with a gun just hanging off his hip. That's just not something we have. And now more than ever, even though you guys have the federal right where they say, hey, we're the federal government, but there's legislation that has to go through. Our guy just goes, fuck your legislation. I'm just right. making it so. And that's where you start to have these issues. And that's why I bring up to Americans so often, are you guys not concerned that the house is on fire and you're just sitting below and it's a matter of time? I'm concerned. I mean, I can't speak for anybody else. I'm yeah. cons- I'm concerned. Um, I have friends of mine. I've had conversations about this with individuals who are extremely more knowledgeable than I am in these situations who are extremely mm-hmm. concerned. So, uh, you know, generally, I think we're pretty sedated, quite honestly, you know, life is pretty good. I know gas is expensive right now. I know people are feeling the burden of inflation or the fact that maybe they are having a hard time getting formula. But at the end of the day, like life's pretty good. Nobody's really struggling all that much relative to the way that we have been throughout most of human history. And we've got a lot to lose, which makes us sedated. And Mm -hmm. that's the problem is everybody's so happy and fat and dumb and ignorant and entertained that they just don't see the writing on the wall. And my fear is that they really won't see it until it's too late. And part of that is the responsibility that we have to own firearms, to train with them regularly, and to use them to protect ourselves and other people if needed. So my question to you then is if we're always paying attention to firearms, we're always paying attention to this, to this, to this, how is America missing the fact that China has come in and bought up some of the largest land in all of the United States for crops? Well, China is an interest. So I, I, I'm not going to pretend that I'm, I'm a, I'm a scholar when it comes to international or foreign policy. We are podcasters all. having a conversation. You do not have to be a scholar for this conversation. We don't, don't but I just want to make sure that I throw that out there that I don't know all the intricacies of it, but China is a very interesting situation. They're not economically as sound as we believe they are. Um, there's obviously a, a, a large component of communism that I think will will begin to unravel and undermine the Chinese economy and culture. Uh, Yeah, it is scary that they own a lot of our debt, but at the same time, you got to almost wonder if the fact that they own so much of our debt makes us inextricably connected where they wouldn't want to see this cash cow be slaughtered. You know, it's kind of like, do you, uh, do you, do you kill the, the, the goose that lays the golden eggs or you, do you just keep collecting the golden eggs, right? Mm. And that's a little bit about what I think is happening is let's just collect the golden eggs, this is China, and we're not going to slaughter the goose, but we sure as hell want to own the goose. Mm, that's, a, that's a good point. I'm glad that you bring that up because it is, if you do look into pretty much anything to do with China and what they're doing, they not only own your debt, but they own some of the largest farmland you guys have, which is right. wild to me when you think about that for crops. It just blows my mind, if I'm honest. And then you've got when things- I hear, well, I was going to say, when I, so again, I'm, I'm not a foreign <laughs> scholar. I, I'm not an economy, professional economist. Like, I don't, I don't know, but you guys can, and you will, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that there's any foreign entity that should hold any debt from the United States government. I think that should be flat out illegal that any other country would hold and own any of our debt. The only people holding debt should be United States citizens, period, flat out. Well, I'd agree because if you look at what that does, it it's... <laughs> It's a pressure point. It's a point of, it, it's of it's easy to manipulate. It's a it's, point of control, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so 
that's what I find interesting being able to have these conversations is you can have them with scholars who fully understand the country and all of that. And they're going to give you a perspective of it. But when you're talking to an individual that is just a citizen of America or a citizen of Canada, and I have these conversations, it's interesting to get your perspective because how you feel about it is the way that you're being, your understanding is, and your understanding might be a little more, hmm more people might be able to relate to it because you're coming at it from a, this is how this could affect me as a human being here, not how it affects our government and the policies that are made and the debt that is held. It's how it affects me and why I think it would affect you. Maybe it's important for you to pay attention, have a little more information or a little more intent in a, holding the government accountable so that you can understand why your, 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 your country is being bought out from underneath you when most people have no damn clue because they're being so distracted by something else. And so I fully am aware and, and we'll make sure to preface this at the beginning of the episode that you are not a world scholar when it comes to events in China. And that's quite yeah, all right. And I, and I don't feel like I need to preface my statements with, with this is my opinion or here, like everybody knows what an opinion is versus what fact is, regardless right. of how upset they choose to, to, to get over, you know, hearing things they don't like to hear. Do you find that you get a lot of feedback like that from your platform or your show in terms of, because I've seen some of the things you post about feminism and um, some of the things you post about the way that you live your life with your wife and your children. And so how has the response been to that in the general public? Overwhelmingly positive. I mean, that's yeah. why we continue to do so well is people, look, I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. And people will sometimes misinterpret my message as that. I don't, I'm, I'm not vested in your life. I don't care. I mean, I want you to live <laughs> a good life. Like I, I want you and your husband and your children to be to ha happy and, and be satisfied. And I, I want you, you to have a fulfilling career um, I want you to be free. I want you to like, I just, I want you to live a fulfilling life. I'm going to share what I think works. And if you don't like it, I still wish you the best. I want you to thrive and I want you to win. But the overwhelming reaction to what we're doing as evidenced by our growth is that people agree. And mm -hmm. yeah, we're always going to have people that, well, you shouldn't push this on me. It's like, what, like your life must be so pathetic to believe that just because I make an Instagram post that I'm forcing my beliefs on you. It's a crazy thought, but people are so sensitive. They're not only sensitive, they're, they're, they're past the points of sensitivity. That's, uh, that's something I wanted to touch on with you because like I said, every once in a while, you'll post something where it'll be somebody that wrote you in the DMs and you respond to it. You respond to it in a really knowledgeable way, but also in a very patient way, it feels like with a poignant, you know, direction that you're trying to go, Hey, don't listen to it. Don't follow it. Don't pay attention to it. At the end of the day, these are all choices that you make as a human being to take in my information. But there's something that I kind of caught on, um, with you and your family that I wanted to discuss because it's a, it's an issue we are having up in Canada. And it is an issue. I know some States are having with their school systems. Why did you feel it was necessary to pull your kids from public school and start homeschooling them? I'll say it as simply as this, when the tree goes sour, the fruit goes rotten. Mm. That's yeah. it. Like a, a, a sour or rotten tree cannot produce good fruit. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. It's and yeah. It's just not going to work. And so the, the government school system is, has been spoiled. It's been tainted. It's destructive. It's dangerous. Now is it, is it all that way? No. And I actually, I have a lot of friends. Did you say you're a, you're an educator? No, God, no. I thought you, Oh, I thought you no. said that. I mean, I know you have the veterans back, the veteran background, but I thought for some reason you said you were in education or something. No, God, no. I hate oh, okay. education. Okay. It's terrifying. <laughs> okay. Well, look, <laughs> I'll say it this way. I have friends who are educators and I think really highly of them. I think there's a large group of, of educators who got into government schooling for the right reason. They have noble intentions. They want to serve these children. They want to provide better education and better opportunities for growth you're part of a, a spoiled system and I'm not interested in putting my children through that. It's mm. just not going to produce and yield effective outcomes for them. So my wife and I made the decision three years ago to pull our kids from government schooling and to educate them at home ourselves. And I think it's going pretty well and I'm excited for their future. 
And I'm trying to advocate that more people do this for themselves. The more of us who are doing this and rejecting and being repulsed by the government educational system, the better off everybody's going to be. For you guys in the United States, um, I don't know what the program is called. We have it in Canada. It's called SOGI, S-O-G-I, Sexual Orientation and Gender Identification. It gets taught from kindergarten to grade 12 up here. And there's been kids in this province that have come home with uh, how to masturbate documents in the, in the kindergarten age. How, how do you advise somebody who has to I'll have- I'll tell you, get your kids out of the school system. Right. And I agree with that. But how do you advise somebody if both parents have to have an income? Why? Have you seen the living, the living, the, like how expensive course, it is? To... Of course, I, I'm part of it. Yeah, but that's my point. It's like, for example, where I live, houses are $2 million a piece at a minimum. Move. For like, but that's not always an answer. That's not always a viable option, whether it's, it's because not, of childcare it It's or just work. not always easy, that, but see, it's always I, an answer. I think it's, it can be an answer, but I think, what do you say to the single mom? How do you fix that? How did somebody who's a single mom do that? My mom was single most of her life. She worked three jobs at a time to take and, care but of did, Were you homeschooled though? No, I wish I would have been. Mm -hmm. But there are That's opportunities. My point. Well, and the beautiful thing about when we think of homeschool, let me say it this way. I realize that homeschool is not for everybody, but there are alternative educational models, right? So- Maybe a single mother can't be the person to stay at home with her children all day, every day, but there's co-op opportunities. There's having your children go to school for some courses and having you provide for others. There's Montessori schools. There's private schools. These are all alternative options to government education. We, I just don't think that we need to buy into the idea that we need to send our children off to government indoctrination camps to, to be indoctrinated into this dangerous and destructive ideology. Yeah, it's gonna be hard for sure. You're gonna have to work, maybe you're gonna have to work some swing shifts as a single mother or a night shift as a single mother. And then you're gonna have to educate your kids. The beauty of, of educating your kids at home is where it takes eight to nine hours at school. It really only takes you two to three hours at home. Okay, so there's an answer. I just shaved your, your children's education, not me personally, but we just shaved your kids' educational schooling in, in by, by two-thirds. So now you're home for three or four hours, you're teaching your kids, and then you go do your swing shift, or you get them in a co-op with other homeschooling. There are opportunities. It takes sacrifice. It's hard. You might have to move. You'll definitely have to change your lifestyle. I mean, I was thinking about this with my wife. We own five vehicles that are road worthy and guess how many drivers we have in the house two and we own five vehicles are you kidding me now we've we're in the position because we built this life for ourselves but i can sell i can sell four of my vehicles we don't even need two we need one really is what we need right right so there's going to be sacrifices that are being made and we have made sacrifices yeah i see you've made a big move where were you originally and where you're at now? Cause it seems like now you're in a different, a very different type of housing than you were before. Are you, so are you familiar with, with the, the States and all that, like the geographically? Yeah. Yeah. I'm in there okay. a lot. Okay. So Southern, so we were in Southern Utah. So the Southwest okay. we're in Southern Utah and then we moved to the Northeast. We're in Maine. So it was, that's it a, was a jump. Big, it was a huge, <laughs> I mean, almost entirely across the country. So it yeah. was a big a very big change for us. Um, and yeah, we, you know, people, I hear from people all the time, friends who are like, oh man, we wish we could do that. But, but what? And they're like, oh, but we have responsibilities. Oh, I didn't have responsibilities. Oh, but we have friends. Right. My wife was third generation born and raised in the Valley. And we lived in, we, yeah. <laughs> we lived in the home her grandfather built with his own hands in the seventies. Like yeah. there's sacrifices that we've made and we didn't know if it was going to work out. It has, which is very nice, but we didn't know. 
That's right. the nature of sacrifice. That's the nature of risk taking. Yeah, it's a uh, I I yeah, I know the United States well and 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 the way you guys work are very uh you're very different than us in, in so many ways, uh, in, in terms of your schooling, in terms of all those things. So some of the things that you're bringing up about the co-ops and the Montessori's, and those are all great options, but unfortunately the way we run Montessori's have to be run through, uh, like government programming and a lot of these things. And we don't have the options, uh, near as many options as you guys do. We do definitely have, if you're lucky enough to be in a community that has similar mindset as you, you do get more of those co-op opportunities. A friend of mine, uh, a Royal Marine, him and his wife have four kids and they want seven, which is ridiculous and way too many. And I've told them that right to their face, stop it, knock it off. We were done. I can't buy any more birthday presents. I can't attend any more kids' events. It's enough. I don't <laughs> I even know where all of yours. No, they shouldn't. Stop it. No, they it. should. The no. best way to affect culture is to, is to have millions of righteous, strong, capable, moral men and women have lots of babies and train them in the way that's going to serve <laughs> them and culture best. I'm serious. I have four yeah. kids. Like, so I just turned two of us into six of us I know. that think about that at a scale of millions so many kids man it's awesome we're one and done homie he's snipped we're out of that game i listen listen <laughs> your wife is a better woman than i am then because but i'm telling you right now i don't know if that's the case but my body my uh, the, i'm gonna i'm gonna i was just about to say my body my motherfucking choice no my point is i of course yeah sure I couldn't do it again. I don't know. I could do it again. I think I might actually die. I'm five foot and the thing was huge and I gained 46 pounds. I don't you could do think. It. No. You could do it so again. You fat, could do Ryan. it five more times. No, I don't want to. <laughs> you don't have to. I don't to. want I'm to. I'm just saying it's a pretty amazing thing. It is an amazing thing that I can just make life. I I am the ruler saying. of human like gods. Like it's insane. You're a you were a god. Yeah, you create life. Yeah. We're magical fucking unicorns and people should treat us as such. I'm just joking. <laughs> My point. It's true. I, but I know I amazing. I, I agree on some point. I don't agree on like the super far like feminism side of like where are they? But I mean in like I make humans like you can't compete. So <laughs> the 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 thing though, I, I find it really interesting. I'm hearing a lot about in the United States, you guys are having formula shortages. Hey, you have you checked in with yourself today? How are you doing? How are you feeling? Have you had enough water? This is your midday check-in, brought to you by Midday Squares. Big breath in. (sighs) I'm back at it. And you guys are running into all of these things. And the first time I heard that, my rational brain went breastfeed. And if you can't breastfeed, like I could only do it to a year because he, there was nothing left. It was, it was over for me. It didn't matter how much I tried, how many lactose cookies I ate, how much water I put in, how much I worked out, how much I slept. That kid was just not getting enough. And mm-hmm. I was not going to go to formula because I knew better. I knew that I didn't want to put chemicals into him at a young age. There's no need for it. The world will do enough of it. So when I heard that, I just went goat milk. Why aren't more people going to goat milk? It's the next closest thing to breast milk. And it's so good for their stomachs and for their development. India puts kids right on the goat if they have to in incidences. So why not? Yeah. I mean, goat milk's a great, a great opportunity, a great uh, alternative. My wife and her mother at one time we were in Southern Utah owned, they had 26 goats. Yes. And and part of the problem with goat milk is not the nutritional value of it. You're hundred percent right. The problem is the regulation. That's the problem is that you have so much regulation around what you you have to do, what has to be involved. Is it pasteurized? Can you sell it? Do you have a license? Do you have the Mm. this and the that to be able, you know, could I offer it to a neighbor? Sure. But once you start distributing goat milk in larger quantities, you're going to start running into some of the same regulations that any other industry has which is designed to put a tamper on people being self-sustaining. So you're not wrong. Goat milk is a completely viable strategy. Mm -hmm. It's just the red tape and the bullshit and bureaucracy that keeps people from doing. And no, who only the fringe talk about goat milk, right? It's weird, right? What do you mean the fringe? Do you think so? I do think so. Like ask a hundred people, you know, about goat milk. They're like, wait, what? They wouldn't know that. 
Yeah, you're right. You're it's right. It's the fringe. It's not wrong. It's good and it's healthy, but it's yeah. not public information. It's not out there. They aren't talking about that. I would like you, I'm, I'm asking you now because I know you only have men on, but I would like you to do a whole 30 minute episode for me on goat milk at some point. I'd, I'd have to bring my wife on that for that. I, I don't know how to go for I it. I don't know what conversation that looks like, but also the other side of it too. Let's talk about um, breastfeeding. Let's do it. I, I made a post uh, probably two weeks ago and I got blasted because I was like, Hey, if you're worried about food shortages, why don't you try breastfeeding your babies? And I said, with the exception of medical conditions, which what you just shared with me would, would it be something I would categorize as a medical inability to do it. Like that isn't an insult or a slight towards no. you. It just means like, I can't produce what he needs. That's we all. tried. We tried, dude. We would do the, I was like that person. Like, as you can tell, I'm that person. I'm just going to seek out the information. We did the, I breastfed and then I would pump immediately after. And then I'd pump before and I would try to get anything to kind of kick. And about a year, about a year was when we started to go, okay, it's just, it's not enough for him. And as much as I want to, and as much as he will, it's just not giving him the nutritional value that he needed. And I had to be, be able to take a back seat and go, that's okay. But you'd be shocked how many women who number one, just don't want to breastfeed right off the bat, just for whatever reason, they just don't want to, or how many women, when they're not able to, what that does to them from a postpartum perspective. I can, and, and I definitely, to the degree that I can, I mm -hmm. understand that because if I'm trying to put myself in that position, that would be a devastating thing because your job mm -hmm. is to nurture this little child. And if you can't do it, I'm sure there's all sorts of feelings of inadequacy. I can't even imagine what that would feel like, but I can certainly see how that would be an issue, but there's right. so many different solutions, right? So breastfeeding, mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, there's breast milk that you can buy. Yes. People are like, people are like, Oh, that's gross. Well, you're literally no. putting your kid on the teat of a cow. How is that different than getting, a, getting milk from another woman that actually has the nutrients that your young child needs. If you have to go to work, pump and bag that like mm -hmm. bag it. Mm -hmm. And your, your child can bottle feed breast yeah. milk that's been pumped previously. Like there's again, if you don't, if you don't want to, that one's hard for me. It's like, you suck. You have a baby, <laughs> like you should breastfeed. It, it's hard. I get it. I saw not totally, but I saw my wife go through it. She had mastitis mm -hmm. and like brutal pain and, you know, nipples chapped. Like I mm -hmm. wouldn't want to do that, but she did. And it was hard. And she made that sacrifice because that's what the baby needs. Not wanting to do something isn't really to me a great reason for not doing, there has to be something better than I don't want to, because there's a lot of things I don't want to do that I know are good and right and true and things I should be doing. Right. No, I, I, I completely agree with you. There's been plenty of times where I had to go to a trade show. So in, in the States, so I would pump, 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 put them in the freezer and husband would get it done when I was gone or my yep. girlfriend, I would run out. I would call her on the phone and be like, Hey, I know you have three and two of them are on yours, but here's the thing. Your <laughs> boobs are huge. And I know you have a lot. Can I have a couple bags? And I would do totally. that and we would go and get it. And there was nothing weird about it. If I weird. needed her, no, even if I wasn't there and she couldn't do a bottle, I would say, put them on your boob, whatever gets it done. Whatever's healthiest is all that I want for my child. And I get, you know, people, they say, well, they can't get access to breast milk. They can't get access to goat milk. They can't get access. They can't get access. So they go and buy formula. I think that's a scapegoat on some levels. I think if you're at a certain poverty level. Yes. There's a reason why food stamps cover formula. And that may be a thing, but I do have a hard time with it because, and maybe again, people are going to come to me. I'm going to get hit for this a lot. Like, well, I can't believe, oh, I'm going to get smoked for it. And, but that's okay. Because you know why? Maybe they saw a different side. Maybe they could see a different side of it. I did it this way. I'm not advocating for not doing it this way. I'm advocating for individuals taking responsibility for their bodies and the choices they make by having a human being and needing to feed it properly. We understand too much about chemicals and antibiotics and milk and the damage it does to kids. I was one of those kids, hence why I yell all the time. My ears are fucked from antibiotics. My point is there's plenty of things that you can do when you're an adult, but 
It also comes down to why are you having a kid? Was the kid a surprise or a oopsie and you're struggling already? Well, then start planning a little bit ahead. Start reaching out and stockpiling what you need to. Start looking at different options, going to different people. Fucking Google's at our fingertips all the time. I really believe now if you don't know something, you're just straight being ignorant. We have access to information like we've never seen before in our day and age. And yet somehow we still have something to complain about every three minutes. And I'm not really sure if that's because we as a Western culture have gotten so soft that we believe nothing bad ever happens or that things are never difficult or that things are so difficult that we should scream about them on TikTok all day long. But we have done something really wrong. And you can see the shift. And I hear you talk a lot about men in society and weak men and not from a derogatory standpoint, but truly from the, we have become soft, but then I've seen you take action with your own children. And something I saw that was really beautiful was when you took your son hunting for the first time. Can you kind of walk me through how that st that started and that process came up? Did he come to you and want to hunt? Or was that something you kind of slowly started to plant in as an importance of being a man or an importance of being a caregiver for a family. I mean, all those reasons are important. I, I actually didn't start hunting until about five years ago. I, okay. I didn't grow up hunting. I grew up more in a, in a, in a liberal minded household, I would say with, with grandparents who were very liberal and even politics wasn't, a wasn't a big thing. I mean, I, I grew up thinking that, you know, Rush Limbaugh was the devil, you know, so, <laughs> um, but I, but I grew up in Southern California until I moved to Southern Utah when I was about 14. And so I'm kind of a city boy. And I was introduced to this very small town in Southern Utah where they would take, they, they called it, I think they called it fall break, but it was not a coincidence that fall break happened to coincide with opening weekend of hunting season. Oh. <laughs> and kids, kids in high school would drive their pickups to high school with a shotgun in their back window of their pickup truck. Like this is where I grew up and there was no school shootings. Like there was no issue. Nobody thought huh. anything about Jimmy having a, a shotgun or Johnny having his rifle in the back of his truck. It's like, Oh yeah, there it is. No, nothing ever got stolen that I know of. It was just the way it was. Um, but I didn't grow up like that. So it wasn't until about five years ago that a friend of mine, Colin Cottrell got me into hunting and it became something that that was very important to me from a provisional standpoint, uh, from a capability standpoint, and then just the fulfillment and satisfaction that came with it. And so my oldest son saw me get into this and he wanted to get involved. He's more of a hunter now than I am. He loves it. He lives for it. Fishing, hunting. He wants to be in the lake or, uh, or up at the, uh, in the mountains or in, in the woods. And yeah, a couple of years ago, I took him on his very first hunt. Uh, Long story short, he was able to shoot a nice little six point um, white tail on my friend Kip's folks property in Pennsylvania, and he's been hooked ever since he's got the the mount in his room, you know, hung up there <laughs> in his room and he's that thing every day and he's so proud of the thing that he accomplished and he should be proud it's something to be proud of. And how old, how old is he. He's 14 now so he shot that when he was 11 I believe 11 maybe 12. Wow. God, you guys are a different people <laughs> in are, a great are way. We, are we? I yeah. don't know. I don't yeah. really know Canada very well. So I, I mean, it depends. Okay. So uh, ge geographically, if I give you a pr uh, province, are you going to be good with it? Or should I just far east, far Maybe. west? Kind of? All right. Let me try. Okay. I live on the far west. I'm as west as it gets. I'm in British Columbia. I'm on the ocean there in the mountains. Got there. It. That's that's yep. our shtick. Besides, I've been, out, because I've been to you? Vancouver. I've been to you, Vancouver. Yes, you have. You've been to the city, the city of Lululemons yes. and is that what anything it is? Okay. goes. Yeah. If, <laughs> listen, if the, if you go to my son's school or you go anywhere to drop off a kid, or you go to a park on a Saturday, if you're, if you look around, you'd be hard pressed to not find at least 10 women at, I'm not exaggerating in Lululemons in a sweater with then either like a, like a long jacket and like a Starbucks or like a puffy Lululemon vest and like a satchel. I always wear a satchel mainly because I have all my things, but I like to have them right here. I did that before it was cool, Ryan. I don't want to hear about it. So you would go there and that's what you see. And that's it. And that's, I'm it, dude, we hike, we wear tight, tight pants and we pretend 
like we are the center of the world and that all of our problems are acceptable and perfectly fine. And kids can have paperwork that teaches them how to masturbate at five. So, you know, we have no problems. We're perfectly fine in, in British Columbia. And then you go to Alberta, which beside us is like the Texas of Canada. And that's where like, those are the type of people you would jive with like hundred percent. It's more your military base. That's where you do your hunting, more of your hunting, the oil, oil fields are up there. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, Alberta is Texas period. They don't fuck around. They just don't all the trucks. All of the, 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 like the big, big men with the tiny little penises with the big, big trucks <laughs> to make up for themselves that then you kind of go to, okay. that's where they are. And then you go to Manitoba um, and then you go to Saskatchewan and that's just flat. It's just flat. That That's it. I have nothing for you there. <laughs> then you get to Ontario, which is like the largest. And that's where the capital is. That's where the protests, well, the main protests happen. That's where. You know, Ottawa has, um, we have bases there, but we also have uh, combat arms bases in Petawawa and things like that. Then you go over to the only French speaking part of Canada who wants to separate from our country, but they also have different schooling. Most of them don't speak English and they really don't like people that do. Then you go New Brunswick where you get your Acadian French, your Nova Scotia and your PEI, which yep. you get your super drunk. close to us. Yeah. Yeah. So you get that area. So if you think of it this way, Andy, Andy Stump goes from Montana and goes up towards us in the middle of Canada to hunt. That's his area of hunting. It's very similar to like Montana type living trees Got and it. all that jazz, except it doesn't cost $2 million for a house in Montana to get. We could have six of them if we just moved there. It's ridiculous. So, and you could own guns. So many guns. Actually, <laughs> I don't own a gun currently. And um, I think I'm pretty sure at this point, if I do own one, I'm going to be on some type of list. Uh, yeah, you can't for... say, even if you did, you couldn't tell me that you did. So I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah. Hey, you never know. <laughs> I, uh, I do have to go get my license soon though, because that freeze on them made me go, okay, so I need a few of these things kicking around. They do have weird laws though here right now. I'm telling you where they've been doing no knock warrants, no knock warrants on a friend's, you know, who's a military who has guns and People who speak up against the Trudeau government right now are really being smashed business-wise, online-wise, um, censorship-wise with Bill C-11, Bill C-18, you know, just body choice and travel ability. We're just, we're great. So just stay there. You don't need to come here. You don't need to I visit. Have, I have no, no desire <laughs> plans to at all. Okay, good. I mean, unless you ski or snowboard, then you're welcome to come hang. But otherwise, I would leave immediately. I'm pretty content with where I am. <laughs> Knowing all of what you just said. It's really funny because I went on Drinking Bros podcast and people were sitting there going, what? What? Yeah, it's, Canada? it's, it's a very, it is now. So, I mean, yeah, I've got friends that are Canadian. It's, it is, it is interesting. You know, the friends that I have are mostly conservative. A lot of them are hunters. I have uh, good friends, the Rivets who, who are hunters. I, I believe they're in, uh, north of Edmonton, maybe Alberta. They're in Alberta, north of Edmonton. Yeah. 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 So they're friends. They're more like Americans than I would think of a typical Canadian. Maybe. I don't know. I don't want to be no, it's making okay. assumptions there, but yeah, it's um, I'm not really too familiar with it, but I'm pretty happy with where we are for the yeah, most part. It seems like you guys have it dialed in terms of your ability to raise your kids the way you want and, and have input in their lives in a way that we just don't have access to um, right now. Or if we do, like you said, it's this catch 22. How do you do it? What are the, what are the ways to make it financially viable and things like that? So your wife, and she's not here, so I don't like to talk about her, but she does seem like she's got her head on her shoulders, but she doesn't work. She's full-time at home because what I see from you is that she seems like she's always there for you guys in a, in a, in a way, but she's always at home. So she doesn't work. Is my correct in that? Doesn't work she, outside she the home. Yeah. <laughs> she works. Let me. Yeah. She, yeah. I'm a parent and a wife. Trust. I get it, but you get it. Yeah. But I'm saying, but she doesn't work outside of the she home. She doesn't work outside church. of the home. No, okay. she, when we started having kids, uh, 14 years ago, uh, she stopped working outside of the home for a paycheck and made the decision to stay at home. And she's a full-time homemaker, housewife. And those are the titles that we use. You know, I know a lot of people hear that and they're like, oh my gosh, like homemaker, housewife, you just serve your husband all, 
No, that's not what she does, but she's proud of being both. She's always wanted to be. Her grandmother was, her mother was for most of her life, did a little work when the kids were older and in high school and things like that. And my wife might actually do that when the kids are in high school, um, when they're busy with sports and other things and have other occupations, you know, she, at some point she'll probably work outside of the home. But for now, her sole priority is being here and taking care of and serving the house and the family. Well, I think that's admirable. And I think it's something to be admired. I wish I had the patience for that. Um, hence the one and done. It's hard. It's hard. It's you a- know, I see what she does every day and it's, um, it's hard work, you know, even when she's gone and I have the kids, I'm like, Oh my God, for three days. I'm like, how does she do this all the time? She's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand that. Like I said, s- several of our friends that want to have like small football teams, I don't understand how they do it. It, it. it does boggle my mind when I think about the amount of sports you have to juggle in life, you know, when things happen too, and, but you have a teammate and it seems like that's the takeaway for me. She is allowed to work, but she chooses this. And I know that you have yeah, been, I don't tell her she can't work. It isn't like she's asking for permission or any, and I'm keeping her you know, enslaved here in my, <laughs> in my kingdom, my castle, like, of course she's allowed to do it's her life, but this yeah. is the dynamic that we have. And also this is the woman that I married. This wasn't right. guesswork. Like I didn't, I didn't just randomly, once we started having kids stumble across the idea that she wanted to stay at home. No, I already knew that. And that was right. part of the appeal is that she wanted to stay home with our family and turn the house into a home. And that's one of the factors that made me want to be with her for my life. Right. I think that's great. I think there's a, there's a curiosity with that for a lot of people, right? It's, it's, is it always the woman's choice? Is it, is it because the husband wants that? Or is it because that's genuinely how she was raised? And she sees that as being a way to make good humans in the world. And I think it's great that you're honest about it. I will say one thing about that. I think more often than not, I'm sure there's exceptions, but more often than not, when a woman stays at home and she's not working outside of the home, it's the decision of her and, and, and her husband, of course, as well. But I would say it's her, her decision because it's in a lot of ways, way harder to have a, a wife or just one parent at home. It's way harder in a lot of ways. And Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, it's a lot easier to throw the kids in daycare, throw them at government school, have both parents working, double the income. There's a lot of more, there's a lot more convenient factors with that. And having one parent at home is not the path of least resistance. No, no. I grew up with a, I grew up with a full-time mom. I I, I say that because she didn't work outside of the home until we were- we were grown up. I was in the military and my brother was gone. That's when she started sure. working. She started working. Sure. Yeah. Because there was what was she, there was no one to take to sports. For there her was, to do. Yeah. yeah. And my dad's a long haul truck driver. So they both team drive and they go in their truck with their dogs and they are gone That's together. Just, yes. That's awesome. Dude, they are in a truck for four to six weeks at a time with their little French bulldogs and they vibe and they bicker, but I they are it. always together. I love it. I think that's yeah, amazing. It is. But she, I grew up with a full-time mom and I can tell you the idea of me not being able to go home and Kath being at home and dinner already being ready. And then we go off to Taekwondo and then we go off to this and the clothes are washed and this is done. And we never went without, we never had it super, super, super easy because two incomes. We had one income. Dad was gone, you know, every two weeks. So it was a very different, there was a lot of sacrifice made there. Now as a parent myself, I know the best version of me personally as a wife and as a mother is not the one sitting in the house. I don't do well. I don't do well. I gave it a hard try. I mean, I I gave it a go. I did all the mom groups which by the way, once you get to know me, you'll understand I'm not a mom group person. Um, and really, I would never have guessed that. <laughs> never, not me. <laughs> I mean, I'll drink my coffee and I'll wear my little lemons, but I will have my opinions about some <laughs> shit. And so I tried it and I, 
I'm, we're more, we've worked out a schedule that's really interesting. And a lot of people have asked us about it and they say, how, why and how? And it's very simple. He does certain days of drop-off. I do do certain days of pickup. We do jujitsu every day of the week. I have Saturdays by myself from the moment I decide to wake up to the moment I go to bed. Mommy doesn't exist. Ha ha ha. Nope. Go play with dad. You and dad have a homie day. Sundays, mommy and buddy day. Me and my bro, we go do all the things, but he gets full time with us and we're with him every night and every morning. And then we're with him after school. So I see now that I am more present, more attentive, more loving, more compassionate. I have a different level of patience than I've ever had. That could be the ayahuasca and the TBI treatment, but <laughs> I have, Hey, no joke. <laughs> not a good person before. And so I think really though, it has made me a better person, but it's not for everyone. If I had four kids, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Well, but here, okay. So here's the thing you're talking about. Like if we were to look at sides of the political aisle and we'll just mm -hmm. split them into left and right. Okay. If, I'm, I'm, I'm on the right. Okay. There's no qualms yeah. about that. Like that's where I sit. All Super right. aware. I would never, if, as should anybody's listen to me for even 30 seconds. Okay. I would never, never put you down or demean you or mock you or poke at you for the dynamic you just shared. Now that's not our dynamic, right? That's not, what we. but I'm not your dynamic. I would never do that. I might advocate for something different, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to get at you for living that kind of life. But you know what? On the left side of the aisle, I get so frustrated and you know who it comes from? It comes from women, women Always. who will mock and ridicule and undermine and demean and be nasty towards women who choose voluntarily yeah. to stay at home. So that vitriol only comes from one side of the aisle. The right doesn't yes. care that you go out into the workforce and you live the dynamic you just shared with me and works, but the left cares that my wife, chooses to be at home and turn this house into a home. Which is really concerning because I think what you would always and should always advocate for on either side of the aisle should be a healthy, loving, caring, communicative, safe environment. And however the hell you get that done, that is your business. Well, it isn't, isn't feminism, the empowerment of women to choose for themselves. And you would think so. You would think so. I mean, that's what it's marketed it as. By definition. But I think also if you look at feminism now, you're, it's, it is not what it was, man. No. It is not. It's not even close to back in the 70s and the 80s when we were marching for our rights to be able to be in government, to be able to have a voice, to be able to get a vote. Like those, it's, We're not are advocating for the same things. We, the pendulum have swung so far the other direction to the point where people call me an anti-vaxxing right-wing person when I'm for the most part starting to realize I definitely lean a lot more right, but there's some shit that I'm like, I'm not, I don't, I don't play in that. And that is very, it's very simple things. Like I believe in a, in a person's right to choose period. My body, my choice do not have a conversation with me about it. Not you. I'm saying in general, like that I is like, I understand I'm a human being. This is mine. This space, this bubble, you touch it, it's mine. You don't get to make that choice. But a lot of people, but I'm also for, I think we should all have access to guns. I think we should have access to training. I think we should have access to different types of schooling. I think we should have access to religious freedoms. I believe in all of those very more right predominant leaning things on the left. The really the only thing I'm really like for on the left here and the only thing is, is the whole, my body, my choice, no government, no church, no, anybody will tell me what I do with this ever. And that's where I go with that. And I get hit on a left, right, and center basis. Very, very clearly of you're right wing, you're a Trumper, you're this because I want to make a choice for my physical body and what I choose to do with it. I'm super right wing. I'm an anti-vaxxer. I'm all of those the, things. The funny thing, can a Canadian be a Trumper? Like you don't even get a say in the, in the matter. But, but here's the thing. <laughs> I'm in America a lot. 
I chart in America. I served alongside Americans as a Canadian, and I'm the Canadian veteran that goes to America and involves myself with your organizations and your veterans and your charities and the stuff that you Got guys it. do. And I'm in Texas a lot. And I'm in and I'm in all of these states a lot. I shoot guns at golf courses for Defenders of Freedom. I smoke cigars. I am as an American as they say as anybody else will be. The difference is I just don't hold the passport. We just need to make it official. That's what we need to do. Listen, I asked Dan Holloway and he goes, I can't help you. You're already married. So <laughs> none of us can help me. I am a lost cause. I, all I know is that when the revolution happens and Canada falls into full tyranny, there is a drop off point in the water. I will meet some individuals at and my family will leave. There you go. Yeah. That, the water thing is interesting. When I moved up here to Maine, I actually spent some time with Border Patrol and yeah. we went it was really interesting. We went out on, on some of their boats and it's like, here's the American side. Here's the Canadian side. And we can op, we can all operate Canadians, Americans in this body of water. Yep. But it was like 20 yards with, within shore now becomes Canada or 20 yards yeah. up to shore now becomes America. It's very interesting. I'd never experienced anything like that before. Well, we live on the water of British Columbia. So we live in White Rock and there is a park called COVID Park. There's a real name for it, but it's no man's land. And all throughout COVID, Americans could come to that park and we could go to that park. And ours is a ditch. We, I'm not exaggerating. It's a ditch. And we can walk over there and hang out with Americans that didn't have to quarantine, didn't have to have all these rules. So there was a ton of trafficking issues. There was a ton of tents mm. and dicey things and weddings and weird shit happening all along my house. Interesting. So we live on the border. I live on the border. And I am I see America when I run every day. It's like the idea of freedom looks amazing until I see how many times you guys shoot up your schools. And then I'm like, oh where do I move? Where do you move in the United States that is going to be safer or protected from the federal government's overreach? Because you guys have federal and state level, correct? That you guys, if the state says hard pass, they can't, the federal can't do anything about it. Am I correct on that? For the most part, there, the most we, part. we, we believe and in, in the, in the founding documents, we believe that it was all established on state sovereignty. So states had ultimate responsibility. So you talked about abortion, for example, the big mm -hmm. thing right now is Roe versus Wade, where the it's been leaked that the Supreme Court might throw that case out. And so people right. are thinking to themselves, well, then abortion's illegal. No, no, that's not what's actually happening. What what will happen if Roe versus Wade is overturned, is that the it will now be delegated to the states. And what you'll see is you'll see states like California in New York have very liberal open policies around abortion opportunities. And you'll see states like Florida and Texas and some of these more conservative leaning states that will have very hard line stances against abortion. But that's initially how the founding fathers established it is that their state sovereignty. Now there are some things, maybe gun, uh, firearm legislation, even abortion because of Roe versus Wade where it's done at the federal level. But mm -hmm. initially, it was all founded with the idea that the states would have responsibility and rights to manage their states in the way they see fit. So what are the top, in your opinion, the top, more free, safer places to move that allow you to have your own freedoms and your own choices and things like that? Well, I think I, I mentioned the two right offhand, Texas and Florida, mm -hmm. uh, because you have state leadership who is actively fighting for these types of freedoms and against some of the infringements upon those freedoms that you see in other states like California, New York, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's interesting to watch because we've, we've gone through this process and, and to see other people just up and move, like you said, you've moved to the other side of the country because it's what worked best for your family. And we've been having these conversations a lot with our family. Where do we move? How do we move? What does that look like? And where is, where is best for our family? I'm just glad that you were able to do what was, what was difficult. There's, there's very many, there's a ton of people in our community that have that saying of like, Hey, you know, whether it's hard or not, you got to do what's difficult, but then they don't actually ever do what's difficult. They just preach it. And right. so I really, I take, 
I, I get hard to, I have a hard time with that because I really don't like it. If you're going to say you're going to do something, do it. And it seems to see, seems to me from the limited inter- interaction that you and I have had, you kind of do that. You say what you're going to do and you do it. And you've taken order of men and created a community of people who feel like they have I don't even want to say a leader, but somebody they can look up to because that makes you sound cultish. We don't want to go there. So like (laughs) somebody they can look up to that can give them pieces of advice that maybe they didn't have as children moving forward in their lives that could help make them better men, but fathers and community leaders. So I'm grateful to you for that. Um, What is next? Oh, you're so welcome. What is next for you? And what is in the plans for order of men? What is coming up to tell us all the great things that we can look forward to with you? I mean, we're starting to do a lot more events. Events are really important to me. I mean, most of what we've done for the past seven years have been all digitally driven. So it's podcast, it's the website, it's the social media accounts, et cetera. Um, But I really see that there's going to be a big need for men getting together face to face. And at some point I would like, and I've talked about this for years, is create uh, regional and local chapters where men can get together And they would have, whether that's a curriculum or an outline that they could utilize to be able to forge tighter bonds amongst each other. I think it's really, really important that we as men operate, and women too, operate in communities face-to-face. You know, you talked about it with your girlfriend with, hey, I need breast milk. Okay, well that, like Mm -hmm. you should be able to take care of that with a friend or a family member. Like the Mm -hmm. government shouldn't need to come in and rescue you for that. Uh, I've got a neighbor here. He's actually in our barn right now. He's a contractor. He's doing some remodeling in our barn and it adds value to me. I'm going to pay him to do that. And this is a communal relationship. We're all here to serve each other and help each other out. Um, You know, the other day I said, Hey man, I need a little plot of my land tilled. And he's like, ah, cool. I'll be over after work. You know, he didn't charge me anything. Like he went out there and I went out there with him and we you know, talk shop for a little bit and he tilled up a little plot and it was good. You know, like I want more men to work together and connect at a local level. Um, And then I've got another book coming out in in the fall as well called the masculinity manifesto, where I'm talking all about how a man builds and establishes influence and credibility, authority in his life and the the lives of the people he cares about. Well, I think that's fantastic. And you're going to have to uh, come on and talk about that if you will, because I think that would be Yeah, Yeah, very useful. Well, great. Because I know, like I said, with the amount of men that listen to this episode, it's always great to have individuals who not only do what they say, but when they say it, they mean it. And that's important. And I think we should be spreading those messages far and wide. And I think it's okay to have hard conversations about things that maybe I didn't necessarily agree with, or you didn't necessarily agree with, but I think it's more than appropriate to be having these types of conversations because people often then more than ever realize that there's so much more in common with each other and ways that they can support each other than there is to need to be decisive and divisionary and just hateful. There's no more need for that in the world. We need to do better. Um, well, I think honest- a great example of that, if, if I could share this is yes. that you and I probably agree on, I think 95 plus percent of things we don't agree on abortion, you know? And so, and yet here we are having a perfectly normal conversation. conversation. I don't think less of you. You don't think less of me. We're, we've had a great discussion about other important topics. And so there's one point we disagree on. And so what? Welcome to life. Like we are all going to disagree on things. It's okay. We're not meant to agree on everything because if we were, that means we'd be living in China. (laughs) Well, I hear what you're saying, but even they disagree. They just can't do anything or say anything about it. That's what's terrifying. That's what I'm saying is you can't even be allowed to have a different thought. And and I think- I think you should always push back on the status quo. I think you should always have hard conversations. And if more of us just did this, the world would not be where it is. And it's okay, in my opinion, and I believe it is in yours too, to tell somebody when they're not doing a good enough job, when they could be doing better and not only just tell them, but you give the tools to help them learn that. And I think that's the difference between somebody who preaches change and doing and doing and doing, but never gives the person the tools to do that. You do the opposite. You give them the tools, you give them the community and you give them the way forward. And I think that's fantastic. And I'm grateful that you were able to have this conversation with me and not see me as a horrible person and not see any of those things that we disagree on as, as, riffs because I think that's what make everybody unique and makes shows like this necessary. It's okay to disagree. Stop acting like it's not. 
Well, isn't that an inch? I mean, let's take abortion just for a minute. I know we're trying to bring things to a close. Like, no worries, I'm man. Gonna, I'm not going to call you a, a, a heartless or, you know, soulless murderer. Right. And <laughs> thanks, and, man. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what people on the right would might say. Right. Oh, yeah. And. And somebody oh, yeah. on the left might say, well, you're just trying to control women. You just want them under your thumb. And that's, and you're not, you're not calling me that like, because neither of us are neither of those things. Right. <laughs> like, it's so wild to me. It is. And I think a lot of times it takes conversations like this just to show that it's okay to have conversations like this, because most of the time, that's another thing I see so much of is people are just afraid to even broach the conversation because of maybe the way that they'll, they think that the world will perceive them. I think that you and I have got to the point I'm speaking for me, but I'm, I would guess a little bit of you too have gotten to the point where we've gotten so much either positive or negative based off what we say at some point, you just got to be who you are and believe in what you believe in and advocate for something that you genuinely have thought of and not just reverberated because it's the next cool, trendy thing to say. And I think that's a huge thing. Yeah. Cause that's also it, right? That's it. Everybody in their Ukrainian flags in Vancouver want to make me vomit because we go from <laughs> one flag to another flag to like, we support it. Like, for example, I know we have to go, but for example, my son's school emailed and said, Hey, we're doing a fundraiser for Ukraine. Yeah, I'm not okay. Doing that. I'm not doing that. And they said, well, why, why wouldn't you want to do that? And I said, who are you donating it to? And they sent the name of the people. And I said, that is a blanket organization. And you're lucky if any of that money is going to make it to the people of Ukraine. I said, do you want to really help Ukrainians? Cause I got a list right now of people that need to be evac with some dollars that need to be done. So if you mm-hmm. really want to put your money where your mouth is, we can do that. We did this in Afghan. We'll do it again, but don't put your flag on your car and pretend like you're, ah, yeah, you're spiritual signaling and I'm done with it. Virtue stop signaling. it. Yeah, yeah. Stop it. Don't do that. There was, there was a thing. I think it was, um, gosh, I can't remember what baseball team it was, but everybody's up in arms because in, in, in the States anyways, it's pride month. I don't know if that's, it's happening here. Oh, it's super here. All right. So we've got pride month right now. And, uh, on this particular baseball team, I can't even remember the team. Everybody was going to wear a slightly modified version of their logo. That was like the rainbow logo. And there was five players who were like, no, I'm, I'm actually not going to be wearing that Yeah, because, and these guys actually tried to appeal and, and explain why. I don't think they even should have done that. Like, I don't need to explain why or why I'm not going to do certain things or why I'm going to do things. I don't owe anybody an explanation for any of my decisions, um, unless it's like my wife, because she, I've agreed to do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's just, and everybody's up in arms about it because they're not wearing this pride logo. It's like, like we, you don't. You sh- again, you're talking about my body, my choice. Like, okay, well, so does that conversation now fly out the window because they're not putting a pride flag on their arm? It's wild to me. It's yeah. so wild to me. I don't understand it. I'll never, we don't change our logo any time of the year. Nope. Well, because... that's right. I mean, your logo already stands for something and yeah. just like the flag already. St- and, I, and I don't even, I, I don't even get it when it comes to our flag. I don't even get behind like, the blue stripe and the red stripe. No, the, the flag already means something. If we want to have a flag that honors law enforcement, or we want to have a flag that honors uh, firefighters or, or veterans, military. Okay. But that flag already stands for something and we're not right. going to modify it to, to appease the doctrine of popular culture. Right. And I agree. I don't think that's, I think that is the, um, the epitome of, of virtue signaling. And it's not something that I won't do. We had this argument, not argument, had this discussion with one of my, it definitely wasn't an argument. I don't know why I said that. Um, we had this discussion with, uh, somebody that works for me. She runs the company with me and, uh, she, this was around the time. Did you ever hear about the mass graves being found in Canada, the indigenous children? No, I don't think so. Well, that's fucking terrifying. That's my point right there. So we don't, our media can't get out. So uh, not last year, I believe it was the, was it last year? It might've been last year. So either the year before or last year uh, in British Columbia up in Cam, uh, Kamloops, I want to say it was, they found the first mass grave of over 200 children um, at a residential school. So you know what residential schools are? 
No, not familiar with it. Okay. Give you a brief overview. Residential schools are, have been run since I believe 1896 to 1997, when the church came over to Canada and partnered up with the Canadian government, went around and literally rounded up every uh, age five to 18 year old uh, indigenous children, all of them took them from their families and put them into these schools where the Catholic church came in, cut their hair, made them speak English, and they never saw their families again. Then they put the rest of the indigenous people onto reserves. And that's when the alcoholism, and we have uh, reserves in Canada that don't even have clean drinking water. So, I mean, we've left those people to just the amount of alcohol abuse and domestic abuse. It's, it's oh, one of the worst gambling, populations. Addiction. Out of violence. control. Exactly. Same up here. But the difference is, as the church came to Canada, partnered with the government and took the kids away. Now what we are finding are mass graves all over Canada. And I mean, babies age five and they mm. talk about it and they've stated and people who are still alive um, from these residential schools, have said, yeah, they would go out to the apple orchard and never come back. And it was because they would speak their language or they would push back and the nuns would beat the fuck out of them. There was so much abuse. And then the church came out and denied it all. And then finally walked that statement back and invited all of the elders of the Canadian reserves to go over to the Vatican and they met with them. And so there's been lawsuits against the church. There's been lawsuits against the Canadian government, but we're finding them everywhere. And you guys just found one too um, recently Mm. in the United States. So there's, there's a huge thing with that. My point here is we've allowed our governments to come in. And we've allowed them to tell us what's okay as society and and take and take and take and take. And now we're starting to see people push back. It's very rare that you see people push back publicly anymore because of the repercussions that they'll have either on business themselves or what have you. It's just nice to see other people push back the way that you are too, in a different way. And having the hard conversations about men should be in people's lives. If you don't have a positive man in your life, find one that can help implement those life lessons to your children, because there's plenty of people who don't, but there is not an excuse to not try and be better for your next generation of children. So I am grateful for the time that you've given me. And I am, I can't wait to have you on again. I can't wait to hear about your book. I'd love the, fact to do that, it. The, the fact that manifestos in it just, just, I, I love it. I love it. Like so much. I like pushing buttons a little bit. Okay. You might know that about me. Just and like, so yeah so there's gonna be a lot of people who are upset just because i chose to use that word which is hilarious those people need to either look in the mirror and figure out why that word triggers them and then move on with their lives that's right that's right that's fine well i've i've enjoyed it too i really appreciate you having me on thanks for the opportunity no worries where can everyone find you and everything about order of men uh orderman.com is the best place or you know since you're listening to a podcast order of man wherever you're listening and you'll find us and uh That's it. That's the best place. Amazing. Well, we'll get all those put in the bio. Thank you so much for coming on. You stick with me. Everyone else, we'll see you all next week.